I now invite Jen Silverman to deliver today's drush. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. My name is Jen Silverman, and first I would like to thank Rabbi Paul, who may not be here in person, um, but probably on Zoom, uh, for inviting me to share my thoughts on our Parsha Noah. I'd like to begin by sharing an excerpt from Eli Weissel's Midrash on Noah from his book, Sages and Dreamers. Imagine what he must have felt as he walked ashore and discovered the empty, devastated land. He must look for familiar ground, vantage points, cities of light and life, dwelling places and their sounds. He knew that they had vanished, still he went on looking for them. Now let me tell you the story of Noah, the day after he arrives on land. He walked barefoot out of the vessel which brought him far from his homeland, and in his arm is a sleepy child, also barefoot. On his side, his pregnant wife and another son. This is the Noah of our time. His name is Kumu. His wife is Mumu. In February 2017, a Korean refugee immigrant family landed in Minnesota, and the synagogue where my family used to belong formed a team, of which I was fortunate to be a part of, who welcomed his family as they arrived at the airport. All barefooted, with no warm clothes, arriving in the middle of harsh Minnesota winter, eyes bright and wary. How scared were they coming to foreign soil where people don't look like them, don't talk like them, and don't act like them? Kumu's family spent 15 years living in a refugee camp along the thai Burma border. These camps are worse than typical prisons and proper medical care is almost non-existent. While we, the mentoring team, did not ask about the family circumstances, we knew that the Korean refugees flee their homeland to escape killings, torture, rape, landmines, and forced labor by the Burmese military regime. So why am I telling you this? Because to me, the story of Noah is also an immigrant story. After all, aren't all refugees and immigrant survivors too? After Noah sees the land had dried, it still took a commandment from God to get out of that ark, to finally push him out. If that was you, after being cooped up for so long, in the ark and you see dry land, would you not run out with glee and race in the sunlight? So why then does Noah hesitate? Why did God have to prod him at all? I'll tell you why. Because unless you are in an immigrant's shoes, you will not know what it means to take those first steps outside outside of the safe haven closest to home. And you will not know how scary it is to see a new place, seemingly shiny, hear new words, and have new responsibilities outside of the ark. Noah, Kumu, Mumu, you can only imagine the profound culture shock they experience as they realize <clears throat> that they will never see their homeland again. Noah is every immigrant who had stepped up that boat or airplane for the first time. He is every refugee who had crossed the border with their last penny, their last courage, their last hope into this land of the free. Two months ago, my daughter Tamar, who's right there, interviewed me for her social studies homework and asked me what it meant to be an American. It's been 24 years since I came here to the US to pursue my graduate degree because my homeland is a third world country who, which unfortunately 
lack the infrastructure to train people like me. So the question brought back memories of my plane ride as I traveled alone with my life in the Philippines packed neatly into two suitcases. And I remember crying the entire way on the airplane as the plane crossed that Pacific Ocean. I remember the first few nights in my apartment, repeatedly banging my head on the wall, asking myself, what am I doing here? I was alone. And I recall in my first week at the University of Florida, having a panic attack, seeing my dark skin, well, it's not so dark, but it's brown, amidst a sea of white people coming towards me. I am an immigrant. It doesn't matter where you stand in the political debate. But what to me is sad is that in all the conversation about immigration, people do not see what so many of us bring to the table. Curiosity, humility, perseverance, and a sense of steadfast duty to give back and contribute. Despite the bias some immigrants experience, we still see this, beacon, this country as a beacon of light. Immigrants like myself hold a certain kind of patriotism that can only be earned, uh, that comes when, when earning our American citizenship. As Noah tilled the foreign land and made it fruitful, so have I and many others honestly and dutifully served this country every single working day since we first laid foot on this soil. Our immigrant friend goes to work at 4 a.m., grateful to have a job, grateful to serve her most delicious coffee to you here in Tiburon, but I'm not gonna name her. Her husband works two jobs so they can afford their one bedroom apartment for their family of four. Another friend works the night shift at the senior living, taking care of elder loved ones so their families can sleep soundly at night. I am a Filipino. I am a Jew, I am an American, and I am an immigrant. I understand how nuanced the topic of immigration is and that policies cannot be based solely on emotion, however sincere. I understand that there is no magic wand to solve this immigration crisis, but at the very least, refugees and immigrants deserve respect as every human being does. The Torah gives us guidance in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 33. When strangers reside with you in your homeland, you shall not wrong them. Again, when strangers reside with you in your land, you shall not wrong them. Unfortunately, the rhetoric you see around immigration today is deeply rooted and has been a part of this long, the long history of this country. For one, there's the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882. And if you haven't been to Angel Island, I encourage you to take a tour where you will see the suffering of 300,000 Asian detainees carved on the wooden walls. In May 1924, President Calvin Coolidge signed the legislation known as the Johnson Reed Act, which cemented a change in how America view immigration from a policy of largely open borders to a new emphasis on desirables and undesirables. The goal, make the United States a homogeneous country. To keep American stock up to the highest standard. Does this sound familiar? The Johnson Reed Act gave birth to USA as a nation who gatekeeps who comes in, identifying who is a worthy American based on the color of their skin, the color of their hair, the color of their eyes, with the Anglo-Saxon and Nordic people on top as being worthy, and Chinese, Japanese, and all other Asian people largely banned from entering this country. Now picture this in your head. The ship exodus arriving in Haifa port, with the British authorities denying entry of 4,500 Jews and ordering the return to Germany. Do you feel anger, sorrow, or both? As we all know, this was part of our Jewish history. And now, picture this in image, another image in your head, an image of a full boat brimming with cargo 
at the present day crossing that sea to Port of San Francisco. But instead of animals, Noah's Ark is full of people of dark-skinned refugees from Mexico, Guatemala, Ethiopia, Thailand. And how do you feel? Do you feel pity or fear or both? In this age, Noah's Ark is also a truck full of refugees looking, looking for a means for safe passage to a new home. Instead, these refugees are locked inside and imperiled by the dangers of human trafficking, and many are turned away, while numerous victims die at sea during their crossing. As Jews, we bear the history of the refugees. As Noah took refuge in the Ark, we as his descendants are all both people. You and I are here in this beautiful synagogue in Marin County, one of the safest in California and perhaps one of the safest counties in the USA. As a result of our ancestors' safe passage through foreign seas and soils. The Torah teaches our identity as both people through Parsha Noah, and as such, we ought to treat people of the Ark with love and justice. We should develop far more welcoming and hospitable policies towards asylum seekers. At the very least, we should hear them and really see them as people, not animals. Perhaps this is why the commandment to welcome stranger is repeated 36 times in the Torah, so we do not forget. It is not lost in me that the Shabbat immediately precedes the national election. And one thing is absolutely certain, America will awaken on the morning of November 6, with half the, century, half the country feeling victorious and vindicated, and the other half feeling outraged and discouraged. On November 6, we will need to dedicate ourselves to renewing our nation. And as a Jew and an immigrant, I will remind my children that no matter the outcome of the election, immigrants must be treated with respect. And I hope that you, my community, would remember that every single Jew in this country is of immigrant stock. Please check on your neighbors. God bless America and Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.